Today is February 24, 2017, and uh, we're going to continue studying the community rule. Let's ask our Heavenly Family to guide us. Elohenu Toda Lakal. Heavenly Family, thank you for all. Thank you for everything. Thank you for truth and love and another opportunity once again to study the community rule and to find out whether it is a document that has been produced by inspiration and whether it contains instruction for us at this present time. So please help us to understand and help us to learn not only the truth of this particular subject, but to learn the principles of investigation and to learn the principles of truth and love and righteousness and how they apply to our own lives. Please fill us with wisdom and reason and help us to discern things as they really are. Toda, thank you. We ask this B'Shem Tzemach in the name of Branch. Amen. Amen. So, the community rule, as most, if not all of you on the call are aware, is a text found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Several copies were found, and it is essentially the outlining document for the community which housed the scrolls which kept them, preserved them, copied them, etc. The community rule outlines what the community is about, what the message of the community is about, the purpose, how they are to go about things, and so on and so forth. Um, To qualify that, the community itself lasted for a couple hundred years. And the community rule is from the earlier period of the community. And so it does not necessarily reflect exactly as things were during that whole time, um, but it does reflect an earlier time in the history of the community. And um, do we want to know how early? We want to know more about the community and we want to know about the community rule, one of the reasons why we're so interested in it is because it, along with a few other texts in the Dead Sea Scrolls, such as the Thanksgiving hymns, it is a writing which seems to be um, important to at least some of the authors of the New Testament. And... It, uh, it has a lot of resemblance. There are places which seem to even um, quote phrases from it, use technical terms that are found in the community rule and elsewhere in the unique uh, literature which came from this community, which was started by this figure known as the teacher of righteousness. So... The community rule, of course, you know, we've found it in our studies so far to be quite important and uh, declaring the principles of righteousness very, very clearly. And it really uh, distinguishes between truth and falsehood. So we have read... um, So far, up to column four, at about line 11, that's about where we're at. And we've been testing it to see whether it is promoting truth or falsehood. So that's a brief recap. Um, Of course, we're going to get more into specific things we've been 
looking at the, you know, the section that we're at now is dealing with the attributes of the spirit of falsehood. Before this, it went through the attributes of the spirit of truth and the consequences of the spirit of truth, and now it's dealing with the attributes or the ways of the spirit of falsehood. And um, the last one that we looked at is brazen insolence. And this next one is abominable deeds committed in a spirit of lust. So before we get into that, I just wanted to ask, does anyone have any questions or comments on the community rule or the Dead Sea Scrolls and the community, you know, things uh, more broadly related to our topic? I just have a comment. I really like it says that we had two spirits in us, the good and the evil, and if we had more good spirit, we would hate the evil. And it just really makes sense to me. That's it. Okay. Yeah, it's this whole thing with uh, the two spirits is a very important teaching. One of the things that I find interesting as I went through to compare the various translations, uh, and again, the three main translations that I've been looking at is this one from uh, Giza Vermez called The Complete Dead Sea Scrolls in English, which is the one that most of you guys have. And then there's another one called The Dead Sea Scrolls Study Edition uh, by Garcia uh, Florentino and a few other scholars and then there's another one um, called The Dead Sea Scrolls A New Translation by uh, Martin Wise and Michael or sorry Michael Wise and Martin Abegg and another guy um, and then I've been comparing that with the Hebrew and this aspect, like how exactly the two spirits are understood is different uh, between the translations. And the point of difference that I'm referring to is whether everyone partakes of both spirits or whether everyone is either partaking of one spirit or the other. And the... Uh, I'm sure that you guys noticed that, you know, when I have been reading the sections here, I'll read it differently, to some extent at least, from how it is in the Giza Vermez translation. And from what I was able to discern, the clearest translation concerning uh, this aspect is actually saying that people partake in either one spirit or the other. Um, let me see if I can find one place that says this plainly. Okay. So I'll, I'll read a section starting on line 15 of column 4, the way it is in Giza Vermez translation. The nature of all the children of men is ruled by these, parentheses, two spirits. And during their life, all the hosts of men have a portion of their divisions and walk in, parentheses, both their ways. Okay, so it's interesting because the word both that's added there in parentheses, which means that it's not part of the original text, is actually not part of it. It doesn't say that the people walk in both those spirits. I'll read you now that same sentence, how it is in a more literal translation. In these are the generations of all the children of humanity. And in these divisions, all their hosts possess an inheritance 
for their generations. And in these paths, they walk. Well, it, it doesn't say there that people walk in both spirits or, or anything like that. It's saying that, hey, these are the two ways and all the generations of humanity are divided according to this and each has a division in, in one or the other and each has an inheritance or a portion in one or the other. And the way, like, there are other places in the community rule that show you that in each way, whichever one you go into, you have a, you partake of it to a greater or lesser degree. But it's not saying that you partake of both at the same time. You partake of it to a greater or lesser degree, and your allotment within that way may be different from another person's allotment in that way. So it's just like if someone joins the community, they are placed within the community, you know, whether they are uh, a leader of 10 or a leader of 100 or maybe they're not a leader of either one group or another or something like that. Each person has their place and certain responsibilities and functions and all of that, and so it is in the other way, <laughs> the way of falsehood, uh, although maybe not in as organized a way, but it's it's still each person has a, a certain pl- uh, part to play and, and that sort of thing. Um, so that's that's one aspect that I wanted to mention, and I believe it's in a section from uh, column three, lines eighteen to twenty four or so. Uh, that that is another place that could be taken as saying that people walk in both depending on how it is translated. Um, But I think it's important to realize that we either are living according to the truth or according to lies, according to falsehood, and that the two paths are very different from each other. It's... um, you know, we're, we're either on one path or on the other path. We're either in the dominion of darkness or in the dominion of light, under the rulership of the devil and the wicked gods or under the rulership of the God of Israel and the angel of his truth. So that's, I think, a very important distinction. Um, So anyway, that's, I, I just wanted to mention that in case you're understanding it in the other way. This is an important distinction to have in mind. So are there any other comments or questions? Or Rachel, if, if that you know, is helpful for you or if, that's, if you wanted to comment in reply to that, that's fine too. Oh, yeah, that helps because I just remember like a couple of weeks I went something like we had like something like e- eco we had a spirit and eco portion, but then once we know more, the good thing we hate the bad things, and then yeah, and then I was a little confused, and it says that we either had a um, good spirit or bad spirit, and thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, and actually, I was just looking here a little bit more, and I just see another place that refers to that. Okay, so there's a a little bit after what I read, maybe in line 17 or so of column 4. It says, in Giza Vermes translation, For God has established the spirits in equal measure until the final age, and he has set hatred between their divisions. So that part, someone might think, oh, well, maybe we equally have it in our hearts. But really, it's just saying that in the world, they are 
contenders, like they, you have two spirits, and both of them are fighting against each other constantly, and they're like equal rivals. You know, you take one person and you could say, okay, well, is this person going, is truth going to win in their life, or is falsehood going to win? And there's an equal opportunity for each one to win. And that's the way it is for, for everyone. And it all really comes down to what we are going to do, which is why it is according to our spirits or according to our will. Um, and then there's another place in, let's see, this looks like it's probably line 23 or 24, also of column 4. And it says, until now, and this, first I'm reading it in Giza Vermez translation. Until now, the spirits of truth and injustice struggle in the hearts of men, and they walk in both wisdom and folly. And then continuing, according to his portion of truth, so does a man hate injustice, and according to his inheritance, in the realm of injustice, so is he wicked and so hates truth. For God has established the two spirits in equal measure until the determined end and until the renewal, and he knows the reward of their deeds from all eternity. He has allotted them to the children of men that they may know good and evil, and that the destiny of all the living may be according to the spirit within them at the time of the visitation. Okay, so that can sound, of course, in that translation, like each person has both wisdom and folly, and you might even take it as, you know, that they are both in equal measure in each person, <clears throat> that God has kind of made the person half good, half evil, and then they either become more good and truthful and less evil and wicked, or they become more um, wicked and, and less truthful and less righteous. That's not really the way it is. And just a few kind of uh, mistranslations or even adding a word and that sort of thing has added to that. So I'll read you now what a more literal translation is, and I'll keep it, you know, very similar to the Giza Vermez translation, but a more literal translation is this. So just before this, again, it's talking about truth and error, and it's talking about how they are um, at enmity with each other. <laughs> That's uh, in the previous part that we read, it said that, that he has established both spirits as equals or as rivals until the final age and has placed everlasting enmity between their divisions. Truth abhors the works of falsehood and falsehood hates all the ways of truth and their struggle is fierce in all their arguments for they do not walk together. Okay, I just wanted to go back for a moment to read that before reading you the other translation of the paragraph I just read because it makes it quite plain before here that truth and falsehood do not walk together, that there's enmity between them, that truth hates the works of falsehood, and falsehood hates all the ways of truth. So there is really a division between them, and that's plain according to any translation of the previous passage. Now, going back here to, this is about line 20 through 24 of column 4, and then going till the end of the column, this is what a more accurate translation of this column says. Until now, the spirits of truth and falsehood contend in the minds of men. They walk in wisdom or in folly. According to his portion of truth and righteousness, it's interesting that the Giza Vermez skips the phrase and righteousness. According to his portion of truth and righteousness, so does a man hate falsehood. So it's saying if someone has a lot of truth 
and righteousness, they will hate falsehood more and more and more. It's not saying that they have less falsehood if they have less truth, and or they hate falsehood less. Um, or sorry, I should rephrase this. It's not saying that they have. You know, if you have 95% truth, you only have 5% uh, falsehood, and then you move up to 96% truth, and now you're only partaking of the spirit of falsehood 4% or something like that. It's just simply saying that as you continue to have more and more truth and righteousness, you will continue to hate falsehood more and more. So if you have a large portion of truth, you will hate falsehood more. I'm not saying that you're partaking of falsehood to any degree. So according to his portion of truth and righteousness, so does a man hate falsehood. And according to his inheritance in the lot of falsehood, so is he wicked and so hates truth. So if you have received a lot of the spirit of falsehood, it's not saying that you still have any of the spirit of truth, but if you receive a lot of the spirit of falsehood, then to that degree, you will be wicked and hate truth. For God has established the two spirits in equal measure until the determined end. In equal measure, or again, as equals, it's that same thing as before, where they're contenders in the world. So God has established the two spirits in equal measure until the determined end and until the renewal. And he knows the results of their deeds for all time. He knows their everlasting results. He knows what they go to. He has allotted them to the children of men that they may know good and evil and, now that phrase, and evil and, there's some damage in the text, and so this is a restoration. It's not actually something that was added, it's just that the, the text is damaged, and this is the best scholarly guess as to what it probably said. And evil and. So that they may know good and evil, and that the lot of all the living may be according to their spirit, in the day of their appointed visitation. Okay. So, I just wanted to read that. Even though I know it's clarified, I wanted to uh, spend a little bit more time on this point because I noticed the passages here um, that have been really interpreted in that way or translated in that way. So, anyway, uh, any further comments or questions? Yes, so we are by default in the ways of falsehood from when we're born. No, actually. Um, to be in the way of falsehood, I mean, we all are born in a world that is contaminated and is falsehood and everything, but Christ was born in the world like this too, but he was not a partaker of the spirit of falsehood, because in order to be within the spirit of falsehood and be on the path of falsehood, we have to sin. We have to be a sinner. And sin is an action. Sin is a, a decision that we make, and none of us are born being a sinner because we've, we haven't sinned yet. It's only when we start to sin that we become sinners. So we are born with a decision to make, either to do good or to do evil. Just like, you know, Ellen White talks about Adam and Eve and how they had to form their characters. Well, they, they hadn't formed their characters yet. Adam and Eve were not created you know, to be, like, they weren't created already good or evil morally because you have to make a decision. 
in order to be morally good or morally evil. They were born with a choice before them. And it's the same with all of us. We're born with a choice before us. But it seems that our tendency as a child is to sin rather than to do good, whether it was taught or it come. Uh, uh, that's what I know of is naturally. I, I don't disagree that with that, but let me ask you, in what way is it our tendency as a child to sin? Um, well, let's just, I guess if we're being specific, say, uh, um, take possession, you know, um, uh, that item there is mine, and that item over there is mine, and that one there is mine. So it's all mine. So a tendency to be selfish comes forth less often, I guess. I'm not sure I'm stating my... So I'm trying to get through right correctly. Less often than the tendency to share. Okay. Now, it is very interesting because there are some children who actually will share happily, right? Yeah. I, I, so, uh, I'm not saying that for sure. You know, it varies. It varies. Right. right. So the reason why I mention that, though, is just to say that it's not an automatic thing. While the tendency may be there, it's not inevitable. And the reason why children are born with tendencies to do evil is because our physical nature has been affected by sin, because our parents have strengthened certain traits, certain propensities, and then we're born with certain parts of our bodies uh, more developed and stronger and certain parts weaker. And that includes different parts of our brains. And so, like, you know, when people become angry, they're using a certain part of their brain. When they're being kind, they're using a different part of their brain. So someone who has uh, their parents were angry and their parents' parents were angry and their parents' parents were angry and it keeps on going back and back and back, that part of their brain, they're going to be born with that part of their brain larger and more developed than someone who had very not angry parents, let's say. Um, and so that's, that's really important because that is going to determine what the child will tend toward, but it never determines the child's choice. And thus, it does not determine whether their child is you know, on the path of falsehood or on the path of truth. Jesus, he was born with just as much of those tendencies inbred into his nature as anyone. His parents and so on and so forth, back and back, however many generations, had developed certain parts of their brains and of their bodies to be stronger and to be more ready for use and certain parts to be weaker and all of that. And some of the parts that they had developed to be stronger were not necessarily the parts that should be developed to be stronger. And so he was born with that. He was born with that in his nature, and he had to strive against that, just like anyone has to strive against that. And so it's basically all it does when people are born in a sin-affected body is it provides a place for temptation. And that's the same experience that Christ had. But the fact that he never gave into it shows that he never walked on the path of falsehood. He never partook of the spirit of falsehood. And so the difference with us is that any of us who, of course, 
uh, end up choosing the spirit of falsehood have entered that and all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God as Paul says and so you know we've all been there done that and uh, we need to be sure to leave the path of falsehood and enter into the spirit of truth. Um, Another study that I'll reference for everyone more on this topic is a study that we have on YouTube called Babylon and Original Sin. And it deals with issues surrounding that. And because the, the common belief, the popular belief in Christianity is that everyone is born a sinner, and that's because of the doctrine of original sin, which teaches that not only are people born with sin-affected bodies, natures that are affected by sin, but sin itself is some sort of independent um, thing that is passed on like a disease from parent to child. And so everyone is actually born a sinner and that sort of thing. And so it's, uh, yeah, that's the doctrine of original sin and is certainly uh, one of the main doctrines which has worked in opposition to the teaching of justification by faith. So hopefully that's clarifying. Yes, it helps. comment? Sure. So I, I'm not even sure where I'm going with this, but I'll start anyway. <laughs> um, so then a two-year-old, uh, which that age group is sometimes referred to as the terrible twos, a uh, two-year-old that's displaying uh, temper, and selfishness and, you know, things like that, that um, that child wouldn't be considered sinning because it's hardly more than a baby, I guess. But isn't that where the importance of from, you know, just infancy um, for the parents to train that child and perhaps perhaps that two-year-old will never go through the terrible twos um, as most children do. And I remember a quote I was wanting to bring out. Mrs. White says, you know, to discipline very young children, even corporally sometimes, you know, um, according to their age and whatever, because if you do that when they're really young, then they'll obey out of, habit when they get older and spanking and correction, even if it's just a little tap on the hand when they're a baby, then there shouldn't be the necessity for corporal punishment as they get older because they will have learned what is acceptable and what is not. But I really, I never was quite sure at what age would a child be considered sinning compared to, I mean, where, where's that line drawn? Um, it, does anyone know? I don't think that there is a line. And it's, there's not an age or anything like that. It's not like, you know, a child yeah. lives to a certain age and then all of a sudden they're accountable for their own actions, whereas prior to that they weren't. What it has to do with is uh, whatever knowledge they have. So I can't see any reason why a two-year-old couldn't sin. You know, if if a two-year-old knows, hey, I'm not supposed to do this and chooses to do it anyway, how is that any different than a 20-year-old or a 40-year-old having something that they know they're not supposed to do and yet they do it anyway? But there's less that that two-year-old will understand and 
have to, you know, they'll have a, a smaller range of choices before them. So there might be another thing that they do wrong in sincerity, which they're not accountable for because they actually simply don't know any better. But that principle applies throughout the whole life, regardless of age. Um, someone could be 80 years old and not have any knowledge of, you know, the Sabbath, let's say, and they could break the Sabbath every week, but they're not accountable for it because, let's say, they literally just have no knowledge, and it's not that they have no knowledge because they've refused opportunities for knowledge or anything like that or just been lazy or whatever. They just simply don't know because they're not in a world in which that knowledge is available, let's say. You know, let's just say they're living in the dark ages or whatever. You know, that's not something that they're going to be held accountable for and it has nothing to do with their age. And so that principle applies. It's just that when people are younger, they are in honest ignorance about much more. And so that's why people look at them as less accountable. Uh, But it just... in a sense, the less accountable because their sphere of accountability is smaller. But within their sphere of accountability, they're just as accountable as anyone in their sphere. So I hope that helps. So that, um, yeah, I'm understanding that to mean um, that it has to do with the level of training and that you can't start too early with a even an infant uh, in and I'm sure some people are better at it than others you know to train their their children in the with the consistency that is necessary but uh, yeah it's interesting go ahead certainly training is a huge part of things for sure. It's the parent's uh, post-birth role because even parents do have a role in tempting or not tempting their child even before the birth of the child, even before the conception of the child because we can live in such a way that strengthens certain propensities and thus it'll be harder on our children or in a way which uh, strengthens propensities that will make things better for our children. Um, and that is done throughout our whole life. But in terms of after a child is born and how the parents raise their child, that does play a large part in how successful the child will likely be. And I say likely because the child does still have choice and can overcome the negative um, example of their parents, let's say, and all of that. Um, Jesus didn't have a perfect example before him all the time. He wasn't raised perfectly, but that didn't stop him. You know, it's not like he, oh, he was just so, so good because he was just raised to be so good. That's not really the case. I mean, when we look at the little that we know about his upbringing and his, you know, his family situation and, and all of that, well, obviously, his, his family wasn't so perfect and so well um, trained in the principles of truth themselves because they rejected his own message at first. So it shows that they didn't really have things right and that they weren't being led by the right spirit. You know, his his mother and his brothers, by the time it gets to that point, Joseph is dropped out of the story, whether he was dead or what, we don't know. It just simply, you know, we don't really have much information on that, Um, but the fact is that, you know, people often have the picture that 
he had just the perfect upbringing and that sort of thing. That's really not the case. Uh, I'm not saying that um, that our heavenly family didn't choose his his family well or anything like that. They probably found the best available option. <laughs> but the best available option isn't necessarily perfect. And um, the testimony of how his family responded to him for the first portion of his ministry certainly shows that he did not have uh, a perfect upbringing. So if anyone else has any further comments or, or questions in regard to the things that we're discussing or, again, the broader issues connected with what we're reading in the community rule, then by all means, mention so. Question? Sure. Jesus, Heavenly Mother was with him. Wasn't she uh, from his birth or even before? And how did she affect him? Maybe through his parents. I don't know of any indication that uh, Jesus' heavenly mother was with him from his birth or even before or during his lifetime on earth up until the beginning of his ministry. That's the point at which the spirit, the mother, came upon him at his baptism and abode upon him, as John puts it, or remained with him and guided him through his ministry. That's how he became the anointed one during his ministry. He was anointed uh, at that point because the spirit, the mother, came upon him. But even at that point, his sister wasn't there. So we don't know of anything that would indicate that his sister was there at all during his earthly ministry, and she didn't come until the day of Pentecost, so far as we know, and we don't have any indication that his mother was there um, throughout his life or anything like that. The only time where she comes and she uh, descends from heaven is at his baptism. Sounds reasonable. I stand corrected. Somehow I was thinking she was there until Sister Wisdom came at his, uh, when he went back to heaven. So thank you for straightening me out on that one. Well, toda Eloheinu. Thank you, Heavenly Family. Amen. I was just thinking somewhere I read in that Ellen Hoyt's writings that, or some books that, differently, but, my memory is not the best either. Oh, well, that's all right. So are there any uh, further comments or questions about the community rule or the things that we've been discussing and the, uh, you know, the surrounding topics? I had one question to piggyback on Leroy's question. I've been wondering this. I'm glad he asked that. So when the when the heavenly mother came down <clears throat> um, to a, a, abide with Jesus at his baptism, John the Baptist obviously saw her because that's how he knew Jesus was the Messiah, right? So he, and I know it says like in the form of a dove, and so it's always pictured like this dove is coming down. And is that literal? Did, did they see the dove? And then, did you just say we were we were confused over here on this end that the the heavenly mother abode with Jesus the whole time till the cross or just at his baptism and then left? Yeah, very good question. Okay, so first, what exactly John saw and what Jesus saw is something that I cannot specify to exactness. Uh, so far as I know, none of the Gospels are accurately translated to say that the Spirit came down in the form of a dove. It's 
that the descent was like a dove descends, um, as in, and the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. Like, as a dove descends, so the Spirit descended. Um, and which specific attribute or characteristic of the descent of the dove was shared by the Spirit is something that, um, you know, doesn't specify. It doesn't necessarily say that the Spirit, you know, like had wings or anything like that. Um, it just, it came down, or she came down as a dove comes down, whether that just simply means gracefully and, and beautifully and, I've and all of that. i heard it said it means foot first, but I don't think that that's necessarily any... Uh, I don't know if there's any backing to that as distinct from any other bird. Yeah, I mean, it just it just doesn't specify exactly in what way it was dove-like. The descent was dove-like, but yeah. it's the descent that's dove-like. It's not that the spirit was in the physical form of a dove or anything like that. Um, and to be clear on the the aspect of how long she remained with him, it's throughout his ministry. Um, right after his baptism, it says that the Spirit led him into the wilderness. Well, that's kind of interesting. The Spirit just came upon him and then led him into the wilderness. Well, the Spirit obviously went into the wilderness to lead him into the wilderness. And very interestingly, um, recently I read something from Ellen White that I had never read before, where she actually says that Jesus was in a vision for the whole 40 days of his wilderness wandering, so to speak. The temptation uh, in the wilderness? Well, I, I didn't say the 40 days of his wilderness temptation, because in the Gospels, like in some of them, it's clear that he was tempted at the end. So he was there fasting right. for 40 days, and then at the end, then he was tempted. Uh, another gospel could be read as he is being tempted throughout the 40 days. The way that Ellen White describes it is that he was in vision throughout the 40 days, and he was as if in the presence of God, and he saw all these various things, and, and so on and so forth. And then, at the end of that, he came out of the vision, and he became hungry, and that's when the devil tempted him. And there, it's interesting, you know, this might be going further than the purpose of this call for me to explain this more, but um, what Elamite says is not just like ad hoc. It's not like just out of the blue, you know, with no previous uh, support or something like that. She just says, oh, and he had this vision. Uh, there are things within the text of the various Gospels that may actually indicate that. Um, it talks about him being helped by angels during the 40 days in, in one gospel that he was visited by angels and so on. And it also, you know, says that the Spirit came upon him at his baptism. And the phrase, the Spirit coming upon someone, is used sometimes in these ancient writings to refer to someone going into a vision. And... Um, there's more in addition to that, but just wanted to mention a couple things um, to say, hey, there may be ancient writings that are attempting to indicate that in some way that he actually went into vision for that period, um, the Spirit there with him. And yeah, the Spirit guided him throughout the rest of his ministry. There's other things. The Gospel according to the Hebrews has at some point in, in it. Um, and then the Spirit took me up by one of the hairs of my head and led me to Mount Tabor. And it, there's different things like that which show the Spirit's involvement with Christ throughout his ministry. So does well, that answer your question? Yes, thank you.
Awesome. What you were just talking about was really interesting. I, I've never heard that either, uh, but it does make perfect sense that that uh, could have been happening. So where does Sister White mention that? Which book? I believe it is in volume 20 of the manuscript releases. Um, and if you want the page, if you look back in the daily text messages that we've been sending out, we sent some things from that section um, in volume 20 of the manuscript releases. I'm pretty sure it's 20. If not 20, it would be 21, but I'm pretty sure it's 20. And uh, so if you look to last week's text messages uh, and you see some page numbers from uh, 20MR, then it should be in that same section. Okay, thank you. Do angels have wings? Do angels have wings? Um, like the dove we were talking about. Sorry, could you say the last thing again? I said we were talking about the de- descending like a dove. Right, well, yeah, it, it doesn't have anything in it in that passage which indicates wings. And I'm not familiar with any passage in Scripture which would indicate that angels have wings. Um, There are certain creatures that it describes, cherubim and seraphim, that are described as winged creatures. And there's, I mean, the ancient depictions of cherubim most often show them as creatures that walk on all fours, even if they have a face like a man's face. You know, it's, it's, they aren't upright looking like angels or something like that um, in the way that people today conceive of angels. And so cherubim and seraphim are described as winged beings. Angels, I don't know of any ancient reference in ancient Jewish writings which describes angels as winged uh, beings in, like in a general all-the-time sense. However... There are uh, passages which describe angels as flying in the midst of heaven and things like that. So there's, you know, in Revelation and so on. Um, But, you know, that could be looked up more to see if there are any, any clear references to angels in general having wings. Not to say that there cannot be beings which are called angels, but just means messengers. Again, angel is not a type of being. It's not saying that there are not messengers, quote-unquote angels, that are winged, but I don't know of anything which would indicate that, generally speaking, angels have wings. We've learned that wings designate truth, right, and feathers, different uh, types of truths or attributes or something. Evidences, yeah. Evidences for truth. But um, I just want to say, because this is going a bit far from the the topic of the community rule and and things related to that, um, so I want to kind of try and and refocus. I think I heard, Mom, I think you were going to say something. Yeah, Um, but it was just just about what I thought was angels. um, I guess they were seraphim on either side of the uh, mercy seat. Um, cherubim, yeah. Yeah, cherubim. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and, and see, I just always assumed all my life they were, they were a form, uh, they were a type of angel. It's, it's really interesting how many years you can live, and then it's like, wait a minute, it, it doesn't really say that. So, anyway, yeah, we need to get back to the subject. I didn't want to stay on that too long. So. Sure, sure. Yeah, and it's it's true. It doesn't really say that specifically about, you know, it doesn't call them when it describes the cherubim with the mercy seat. It doesn't call them angels. It's not to say that the term angel cannot be applied to them, right, even, but we have to understand what angel means and so on and so forth. So anyway, does anyone uh, else or anyone who, even if you've said something before, um, are there any other 
comments or questions in regard to the community rule and the things that we've been looking at in relation to it? Well, I'll just say that in general, this section um, that we're getting to, I would just, you know, we're testing the community rule, seeing, okay, is this true or not? And we're taking it piece by piece, section by section. And I would say that it's true that this section is a, a demonstration of the spirit of falsehood. Certainly. Amen to that. And we've been learning that we've got some falsehood or mis misconceived ideas in our brain. Certainly the case, yes. Okay, well, if there are any more comments, uh, you know, on this whole subject in a broader sense, feel free to mention it, but we won't leave too much more empty space. Um, and if not, are you guys ready to get into the next way of the spirit of falsehood? Yep. Yep. Okay, so the next one, abominable deeds committed in a spirit of lust. So does anyone want to explain how they understand that and whether you think it is actually a way of the spirit of falsehood or not? Lust is one of the main things that drives us to do wrong, seems like. Wanting something or wanting to force something on somebody else or our strong desires. So I'm not sure if I got the first part of what you're saying, but uh, that's how you're understanding the phrase abominable deeds committed in a spirit of lust? Right. The reason we do abominable things is because we're lusting you know, we want we want something like somebody else's wife or, or whatever or somebody else's property. Okay, so that's interesting because um, what I'd like to do, I, I want to ask someone else what they think about it too, and then. For, for the sake of comparison, um, and I want to see if I want to see if other people are understanding that in the same way you are or in a different way, and then we can discuss that. So does anyone else want to explain how they understand that phrase, abominable deeds committed in a spirit of lust? Maybe we should look up what that word lust means in the first place, too. Well, abominable means causing moral revulsion, very bad or unpleasant. So, in a, I guess in, in a common, in a worse kind of way, in a very devious way, these deeds are committed in the spirit of, it says lust, but, and then further on down, lewdness is added, but, I mean, in, uh, I get the feeling that in the spirit of lust, that the absolute hatred, um, uh, where you actually are just very devious 
and you want to bring harm with this deed, uh, so that possibly that you break them to uh, because you're wanting revenge or something. Uh, but I, I feel like with the terms used, it's a very, very um, terrible deed done in the spirit of they really want to do it. They, re- they enjoyed bringing somebody else uh, harm in some way, maybe not physical harm, mental anguish, abuse, uh, in that in that way. Sounds like extreme love of self. That's what I was going to say. Extreme selfishness. Me, me, me. So that's how you guys are understanding the word lust in particular? Extreme selfishness? Now you're loving self more than any anybody else. You love bringing harm. You love bringing uh, evil upon another person to hurt them for your own benefit. I, I think it's, um, I mean, definitely harmful deeds, but they're um, in the spirit of, uh, I, what lust would mean like sexual desire. So, you know, to me, they're um, abominable deeds that are done in the spirit of our, you know, improper sexual desires and absolutely harmful to yourself and to the other person that you're committing that deed with. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's certainly more along the lines of what this is specifically referring to. Um, and, you know, I think that everyone here knows, you know, the word lust typically refers to sexual desire. And so abominable deeds committed in the spirit of lust or in a spirit of lust refer to sexually immoral actions. So this word that's translated lust here, if if you're reading from a another translation or it's if this translator chose to translate it in the same way that the King James does, then it would have been uh, translated as whoredoms. Um, or another common translation would be fornication. That's a, a common translation of this word. Just to be clear, too, the word fornication in the Bible does not refer to premarital sex. It simply refers to sexual immorality in whatever form it takes, which is why nowadays, because people use the word fornication to refer to premarital sex, Modern translators usually use the phrase um, sexual immorality rather than the word fornication because there's, you know, I mean, Matthew 5.32, you know, whosoever shall put away his wife saving for the cause of fornication. Well, wait a second. How can someone put away their wife saving for the cause of fornication, they're obviously already married. And people usually say, oh, except for the adultery. That's actually misquoting it. It's using fornication, which is a far more broad term than adultery. And it can be used also in metaphorical circumstances to refer to breaking of a covenant. So, you know, Yahweh's covenant with Israel is likened to a marriage and fornication is 
you know, the, the breaking of the covenant of the children of Israel by idol worship and, and things like that. Like, the, it can be used in a metaphorical sense as well. But in its most uh, basic sense, it refers to sexual immorality and, you know, there, there are things like in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 5.1, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. You know, different phrases just showing that the word fornication does not mean premarital sex in Scripture. It's talking about sexual immorality. It's a far more broad thing. Um, so abominable deeds or detestable deeds committed in a spirit of sexual immorality. When King Ahab, he was heartbroken because he couldn't get what he wanted the neighbor's land, and Jezebel had him killed so he could have it. That was a, kind of a lusting thing. Are you just using the phrase in terms of a strong desire then? Like the word lust? Right. Regardless of if, a, if it's sexual or not? Right. It wasn't a sexual thing. He just plain wanted his neighbor's vineyard or something. Okay. Do you understand, though, that here, you know, the words that are being used here in the community rule, though, it, it is specifically talking about sexual sin, though. Like, is, is everyone clear on that? How did you come to that conclusion? I'm, I'm not sure about it. I'm clear on that. I, I see here that you've got the Hebrew. You You actually know, based on the language in which the document was written, it's more specific, you know, it's less open to interpretation to some other idea of lust. It's very specific to sexual sin, sexual immorality. Yeah, so the word that is translated here as lust in Hebrew, and it's very small on my screen, so I want to look at the vowel points to see if I'm pronouncing it correctly. It's zenut in Hebrew. And it specifically refers to sexual immorality. And the word abomination here in Hebrew is just to'ava. And it refers to something that is a detestable thing um, and is often used to refer to sexual immorality in some way or, you know, when sexual immorality is mentioned, it is referred to as being an abomination throughout Scripture. But the term can be used to refer to just any detestable thing so, for instance, uh, Genesis 43, 32. Um, yeah, it says that Egyptians could not dine with Hebrews, for that was a detestable thing to Egyptians. They wouldn't eat together with, with Hebrews because they thought that it was a t detestable or abominable thing, and it, it's this same word here. So this is talking about hateful things, like things that are just testable, worthy of hate, things that are considered abhorrent or abominable in some way, vile things. And um, it's talking about those sorts of actions, those sorts of works or deeds committed in a spirit of sexual immorality. Well, in the time Does that of help to clarify it? Yes. Now that straightened it out. I appreciate that. So during the time of the community rule, 
that was a main wickedness that was going on on then that they put it in the community rule. I think it's certainly been a, a main wickedness in every every generation, yeah. really. We're yeah. back before the flood. Yeah, it's, it's been around for a very long time. And, you know, I mean, every uh, way of the spirit of falsehood that it mentions here, everything from greed to stiffness of neck and heaviness of heart and all of that, you know, all of these things certainly were things that were prevalent throughout the world in the days in which the community rule was written. That's certainly the case. And the fact that they are here does show that, yeah, these things were prevalent at that time. Um, though it's not necessarily the case that they were any more prevalent then than they are today or in any other generation because greed has been around for a long time and is very much so alive today. Slackness in the search for righteousness is at least as prevalent now as it was then. And the same is true for sexual immorality. So what do you guys think is... Excuse me, go ahead. Well, I was going to ask a question, but if you had a comment first on what I I just said, you go ahead. I was just going to say the devil knows that it works well, so you don't don't have to change. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And these things also, these are just the, in a sense, the inevitable result of what happens when people allow themselves to live according to falsehood. So, what do you guys think? Is it true that abominable deeds committed in a spirit of lust or a spirit of sexual immorality, is it true that that is really one of the ways of the spirit of falsehood? And if so, how so? I think it's definitely true. Um, it clouds our minds from thinking of righteous things, and it also clouds and harms the mind of whoever you committed this deed against, um, and can take them off track. And, and you know, I can think of examples of people who no longer believe in God because they can't believe a God that God would allow something like that to happen, or. You know, it's just, it's just a way for Satan to use both sides of it, you know, um, to uh, destroy our minds. Take control of our body. Literally, we we just lose our mind or our reasoning. It becomes a strong addiction. Yeah, you know, these, you know, abominable deeds committed in the spirit of lust, I would definitely say that it is part of the spirit of falsehood. Um, These things, I mean, you know, someone might come to this and say, okay, well, if you're talking about sexual immorality, that means you have to define what is sexually right and what is sexually wrong, and... People define that in different ways. Of course, if you're talking about sexual immorality, it's uh, this is a sub-topic within the general topic of morality. And so it relates to that, you know. And if someone has an authoritarian view of morality, as most religious people do, then it comes down to okay, well, whatever God said is sexually right to do is sexually right to do, and whatever is sexually wrong to do is sexually wrong to do according, again, to the decree of God. And God could have decreed it to be anything, but God decreed it to be what it is, and that's why it's right or wrong to do this thing or that thing. And some people look at that and say, well, that doesn't make any sense. How can God decide what is sexually right and sexually wrong, and if he could have chosen something else, then isn't that just rather arbitrary and and so on and so forth? And so 
it becomes a matter of, you know, finding another way to determine what is right and wrong. And some people literally think there is no way to determine what is right or wrong sexually because there's nothing wrong. We all just have a, a right to do whatever we want to do. And sometimes people say, so long as, you know, it's most people would say, I'm sure, that so long as there is mutual agreement, there's consent on both sides, then it's totally fine. This is all, you know, everyone has a a right to use their body however they want to. And therefore, it is totally okay if two people get together and decide that they want to do anything with their bodies, with each other. You know, people really think, okay, that's that's fine. And someone could argue in that way, and it might seem to make sense at a given point. Um, and, of course, along those sorts of lines, more along those lines at least, that is kind of a certain view within what might be called secular morality. And secular morality mostly views morality as being uh, determined by societies and that as, you know, basically we are a social species and as societies develop, they determine collectively what is good for the society and what is bad for the society and to do what is bad for the society is what is wrong that is what is immoral, and what is good for the society, what everyone determines to be a kind of code of conduct that they would like to have, that is what is moral. Now, that's how things actually do function much of the time, but that's not actually describing what is really right and wrong. That only describes what people consider to be right and wrong, and secular morality basically says, well, that's all there is. That's all it comes down to. Um, And within that, some people might say, well, in this society, we do say that, hey, if a man and a woman are married, they shouldn't go and have sex with other people. You know, that's something that people within a society would probably argue. But then there's going to be subgroups within that society that say, hey, we don't care. We think that, you know, people shouldn't need to practice, uh, you know, strict monogamy or or anything like that. And so why not? You know, let's say you have a group of 10 adults, whether they're married or not, and they all decide that they just want to all have sex with each other. Well, what's wrong with that? You know, people could argue for that, and some people do argue for that. And the reason why I'm mentioning these things is because I, I, it's important when we're talking about anything dealing with morality to really have a good understanding of this. And when it comes to sexual morality, the same principles apply as apply in other cases. Um, but unfortunately, often people don't view it in that way because people don't see it being of much consequence, unfortunately, even though this is one of the areas of life which is actually of the most consequence and which it is easiest to see how sexual immorality is actually part of the spirit of falsehood, how it actually does play into evil and falsehood and and all of these things. Um, So let's just take, for instance, a married couple who does decide, hey, we are going to serve each other and love each other and all of that. Okay, our five-minute alarm just went off. Um, So I'm going to hang up and call back in, and we're going to discuss this a bit more. It may be... um, too broad to have a full discussion on this all tonight, Uh, so we'll have to see about that. But either way, I'll hang up and then we'll call right back in. I got a comment when you get back. Okay, looking forward to hearing it. We are back now. Leroy, you said you had a question? 
Yes. That when you do wrong, you might not think it affects you, but from my experience, it separates you from goodness, and it will destroy you when you're doing wrong. When you're doing right, it separates you from them that are doing wrong. So it's like a law of nature. When you do wrong, in the end, it will destroy you. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and with this, with sexual sin, it is very, um, sexual sin causes some of the worst problems, really. And so in that sense, it should be the most evident. I mean, people know that family is important and that being on good terms with the people who you live with every day is important and it has a dramatic effect on practically every aspect of life and at least every social aspect of life and even more. Um, And so, you know, when people, let's just say you have a married couple and one partner is unfaithful in that marriage, well, that often totally rips families apart. And a lot changes as a result, and it's not a good thing. You know, when people get into that, it's it's really, really bad. Um, when people are into sexual gratification, like Ed pointed out, it clouds the mind. You know, when people are constantly gratifying their sexual appetite, they cannot clearly focus on intellectual things. It just, it doesn't happen that way. (laughs) And because of that, they are weakening their intellect and strengthening, as Ellen White puts it, the animal passions. And it's unproductive. It's a waste of time, and it's worse than a waste of time because people do become enslaved to it. You know, Gary pointed out that it can be addictive. Well, yeah, people end up totally addicted to sexual gratification in whichever form it takes in their particular case. And it's not a good thing, you know. If people become addicted to it like a drug and, and people find themselves powerless just like to a drug, um, not to say that they are actually, in fact, powerless. They may be of themselves, they may need help, but our Heavenly Family is always there to bring help. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's lots of things. I mean, if you take homosexuality, for instance, well, there's a lot of sexually transmitted diseases. And and not saying that it's exclusive to homosexuality, far from it. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, STDs in heterosexual, you know, interactions as well. But the rate of it in the homosexual community is far higher. And it's just, it's showing you that, okay, there's something that is actually working against people who who engage in that behavior. It's not actually for their well-being. It's not actually for the upbuilding of, of who they are. And, you know, that's a problem. And this is something, you know, that's not stating anything necessarily from a religious perspective. People who are non-religious even within homosexual communities, recognize that as a problem and are trying to do something about it because people are dying, people are suffering. It's bad. It's just, it's really not a good thing. And, you know, this this just extends so far beyond that. I mean, there are certain sexual sins which pretty much anyone recognizes. I mean, the vast majority of people recognize, you know, certain sexual sins as being, in fact, 
wrong and being bad, you know, molestation and bestiality and those sorts of things are are things that very few people think are just okay, <laughs> you know. It's recognized and I mentioned that to say that for those who like to think of themselves as, you know, kind of free love and and just, you know, sexually open, no, there's, you know, almost everyone has their limits and recognizes that, no, there are some things that are wrong. And one of the biggest problems with, you know, our society in the West today is that this area of morality becomes a taboo where it's like it's it's not right to discuss what is actually right or wrong when it comes to sexual morality. It is as though there's some sort of, oh, no, each person just gets to decide this for themselves, and and that's it. Now, I do have to say, though, just to be clear, that it is true that if you have adults that are consenting with each other, that they actually do have the freedom to do whatever they want to do. They actually do have that freedom, and it's not necessarily the place of another person to deny them that freedom. But just because they have that freedom doesn't mean that it's right for them to do it. You know, people have the freedom to lie. It doesn't mean that it's right to lie. And it wouldn't necessarily be right for someone to, you know, duct tape someone's mouth shut to prevent them from lying just because they lie. No, I mean, that's, it's not the way it works. Someone should not restrict someone else's liberty just because they're choosing things that are wrong. However, the person should have a right to say, no, that is wrong. So it's, it's the same in, in our society today that it should be the case that we should be able to discuss what is right and wrong in regard to sexual morality, just like in regard to any other aspect of morality. It should be free in terms of discussion, although people should not uh, try to force their views on others or restrict others' liberties because of their personal convictions, even if their convictions are correct. So it's, uh, you know, but all of this, I, I think that people can see when you look at the extreme examples like molestation and rape and, and things like that, when you look at those sorts of examples where you can see like, okay, yeah, um, sexual immorality is actually part of the spirit of falsehood. You know, it's kind of like, if you, if you take something like rape or molestation, in a sense, that is akin to stealing, where someone is pretending that, you know, the other person's body is theirs, when in fact it is not theirs. That's an example to show, oh, this is uh, part of falsehood. You know, this is built on lies. It's not actually true. Um, if you take homosexuality, well, I really believe that probably the vast majority of homosexuals believe that it's either for their benefit or at least in some way for their benefit. Like, it's either just totally a good thing or at least in some way a good thing. Those who recognize, of course, that there are physical problems with it um, might think that, well, you know, it's still, it's emotionally gratifying or it's, you know, in some other way gratifying and therefore equated with being good. Well, there's plenty of things that are gratifying that aren't actually good. <laughs> you know, like if someone uh, overeats on sugar or on anything. some or on anything, yeah, anything anything that is 
not healthy, well, obviously it ends up being recognized that, no, that's not actually morally right because it's working against truth. So the idea that homosexual behavior is good for a person or morally right is built on lies simply because it's not actually good for the individuals. It's not actually beneficial, like in terms of health, in terms of uh, social structure, in terms of family, and, you know, all those other things. And you, you can do this with any sort of sexual sin. One of the most common sexual sins is self-abuse, a.k.a. masturbation. And, you know, people think, oh, well, it's just, just the person. They're not harming anyone or anything like that. Well, guess what? Masturbation is also built on lies. It's, again, the deception that it's going to bring gratification, but it's not actually going to bring gratification. It's not actually um, something that is is ultimately for the benefit of the person. It may be a temporary pleasure, but it's everyone knows that it's only a temporary pleasure. And it's followed by displeasure. And it's you know, it's the sort of thing you know, it's it's not actually good for health either. I know that some people try and say it is, but it's not actually the case. You know, just like people, grad, like in any sort of relationship, like say you have a heterosexual monogamous marriage and people are just having sex all the time, well, that's not good for health either for a number of reasons. But one reason, like, like let's just take uh, masturbation. I think Doug pointed this out in one of his studies about the depletion of zinc. <laughs> well, that's not good. You know, people, whether male or female, people who engage in self-abuse are wasting their energies. That's not good for them. Wasting their energies and not able to use it for other things. They're also, people become addicted to abusing themselves and end up um, not only wasting their time, but end up strengthening those propensities and weakening their intellect. Yeah, and this, their health. Actually, yeah, and, and their health. I mean, there's lots of effects of these things. And, you know, the, again, you could take any sexual act and examine it to see whether it is actually good or bad. If it's actually working for truth or against truth. Is it built on falsehood or is it built on on truth? And, you know, by definition, actually, sexual immorality is built on lies and is against truth. How do we know this? Immorality <laughs> means that which is against truth. Because morality, as we've talked about, the only consistent, right and truthful way to define morality, what it is for something to be moral or to be immoral, is according to truth. It cannot be consistently defined by saying that morality is just simply uh, up to social custom. Oh, like opinion. It, yeah, it's, it's not up to opinion. And likewise, it doesn't work to say that God decides morality because he's just, he's just the, the, you know, biggest, baddest dude in town, and he's the guy who gets to choose what everyone else should do and not. You know, that's might makes right, and that's not right. That's bullying. And so that's, you know, we've had our discussions on morality in the past, so I won't rehash the whole thing in as much detail as I might, but genuine morality, what it really comes down to is simply 
that which is moral is that which is in harmony with physical reality, truth. Again, the word truth is that which is in harmony with physical reality, usually in terms of statements or ideas. Statements or ideas are true if they are in harmony with physical reality. You say they're in harmony with nature, too. Sure, if you define nature as physical morality, then yes. So, if, you know, you could say it like this. Truth and morality are terms that are used to describe harmony with physical reality. Truth, the word truth, usually is describing ideas or statements which are in harmony with physical reality, whereas morality usually describes deeds that are in harmony with physical reality. On the flip side, falsehood describes ideas and statements which are opposed to physical reality or not in harmony with physical reality. And immorality describes deeds, actions, and so on, which are against physical reality or not in harmony with physical reality. This is the usual way that things are defined. So truth and morality, falsehood and immorality, there's a strong connection between them both and I, I can't say that they're independent of each other. I think it is immoral to say something that is not true. That is, unless someone has no knowledge to the contrary and, and they're stating according to what they honestly know, according to the evidence that they have at the present. Um, but still, to, to act, you know, thinking and speaking out of harmony with reality is action and thus can be described as immorality as well. Acting in a way that is out of harmony with reality obviously has to do with thoughts that are out of harmony with reality simply acted out. And so it has to do with falsehood as well. Like you cannot really ultimately separate them. It's just that the way that we use them is that words like truth and falsehood typically describe statements and ideas, whereas morality and immorality typically describe actions. But really, it's talking about the same basic thing. Harmony or disharmony with material reality. And so when we're talking about abominable deeds committed in a spirit of sexual immorality, well, yeah, that's based off the spirit of falsehood. It absolutely is a part of it. Amen. So, yes. I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind around the term, what is it, physical reality? If if I can relate to nature or something like that, I just... I'm having a hard time wrapping around the physical reality if I'm remembering the term right. Okay. Yeah, I'll be happy to kind of break it down, but let me ask you first, how do you define nature? It's what was from the the way God created it, you know, from the creation or beginning before it went astray. Okay, so would you consider, like, if you walk outside and you see um, a, a tree, for instance, would you say that that's part of nature? It was part of the original creation. It's not as healthy as it used to be or as big, probably. How about a beehive? Likewise. 
how about a wooden box? No, that wasn't part of nature. It wasn't created in the beginning. Man made that. How about um, a ship? Likewise, something man was given the privilege to build. Okay, now how about um, all the pathways of an ant colony? Lost me on that one. Oh, it's okay. It's like an, an ant farm or an ant home. Uh, maybe not farm is the best phrase in this instance. But you know how ants build themselves this huge, elaborate home, right? And there's tunnels through the earth. Yeah, so tunnels. So ant tunnels, would that be part of nature? But they were created to, to do and live, apparently. But it's probably been changed, you know, because of sin. So the reason why I'm asking all these things is because, and I'll, I'll kind of address some of the things <clears throat> more specifically, um, but the reason why I'm asking these is because I'm going to draw out the fact that we often categorize things in an arbitrary way that doesn't actually have anything to do with the way things really are, but we categorize things in the world based off our preconceptions. So most people would look at a tree and say, mm -hmm. well, yeah, that's, that's part of nature. And most people would look at a beehive and say, well, yeah, that's part of nature. But they would look at a wooden box and say, oh, that's not part of nature. Now, this is really interesting. What's the difference between a beehive and a wooden box? A, a beehive just doesn't happen without bees doing things to make the hive. Just like a wooden box doesn't just happen without a person making a wooden box. The reason why we don't view a wooden box as part of nature has nothing to do with the way things really are. It has to do with the fact that we have separated ourselves from nature in our minds. We have separated humans as being not a part of nature. We're something totally different um, when in reality we are. You know, we're part of nature. We're an animal just like any animal. And the things that we make and do and alter are just as natural as what a bee does and makes and alters. Amen. You know, a field of wheat, someone might say, that that's natural because you're out there and you see this big field and it's all plants and all of that. <laughs> but man, it takes people to make a field of wheat, you yeah, know? A field of wheat doesn't just grow all by itself. Yeah, I mean, just, just out just there. Not just a field of wheat all alone. <laughs> absolutely. Like, you don't, you don't get rows of trees like apple trees or like orchards and like people would think an orchard is nature right but you don't get an orchard just out of the blue no you have plants all mixed together you don't have things in in rows like that and just one plant dominating and all of that people might say that pulling out a weed is unnatural right i mean people probably wouldn't say that but an argument could be made <laughs> so, the reason why I use the phrase physical reality is because it avoids the uh, misapplied paradigm of natural and unnatural. 
Well, I can, so I'll, 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 all I can I'll explain. Excuse me, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I'll, I'll explain exactly what I mean by physical reality. Uh, so do you want me to do that, or did you want to ask or say what you're going to say first, or what? I was just going to say that physical, I can relate to that. Physical and nature is similar. Maybe it's the reality part that, that I'm having a problem with. I don't know. Go ahead. Sure. So uh, I'll explain the word reality first. Reality simply just means the way things are. Um, it's th in philosophy. There's uh, and this is getting to like basic, you know. When I say philosophy, I'm not talking about like oh, people having all these complex views. The most fundamental parts of philosophy, just the, the way that we think about things. The it's you know there are people who are realists, people who believe in realism. Realism is the belief that there is a way that things are. There is um, a, a universe and a world that is independent of any person's perspective. It is what it is just because that's the way it is. It's not just all perception. It's not that way because someone's perceiving it. So you have... The, the question of, okay, does, uh, <laughs> I'll use, a, a, I'll alter a famous example. A tree falls down in a forest, but there's no one there to see it fall. The question is, does it really fall if no one sees it fall? Let's say there's not even any animals around or anything like that. It just falls. But does it really fall, though? Or is it just that when someone walks through the forest and they see a, a tree laying on the ground, that that's the only thing that's reality? And it's only become reality because the person conceives of it to be such. Okay, so a realist would say, things are the way it is and it doesn't matter what people think or whatever. It's just that there is an independent um, objective reality, an independent objective way things are. And that's what reality is. It's just simply the way things are. And a realist says that is the way it is, whatever it is. Even if you still have to define what it is, it is a certain way. And someone who is not a realist, like the two camps are realism and idealism. Idealism says that the thing which is actually fundamental is just ideas, just awareness. And this is in, you know, this is really a non-physical approach to things, a, a, a non-material approach to things. And it says that basically, uh, just one moment actually, if that's all right. Idealism basically just says that all it is is really conception, and that's it. There is no table other than in your conception. You conceive the table, and therefore it is, but it only exists as a conception. And if you conceive of it differently, you can alter your reality by conceiving of it differently because it ultimately is your conception and people may conceive contrary things and they are just as real because that's that's what or it's just as true just as whatever the term real might not be used as much because they're not realists they're idealists and so they're there is space for contradiction and for all of that because there is no one way things actually are. It's just a conglomerate of different ideas. So reality means the way things are. When you say physical, that's describing the way things are. It's defining what the reality is. 
It's defining how things actually are as being physical. And the word physical specifically describes to, or it specifically refers to the way things uh, are as described by physics. You can describe things using space and, and mass and particles and all of that to say material is a little bit more specific to matter, which, again, you're talking about little bits of actual stuff, of physical stuff. You know, things have properties. You know, particles have various properties that define them. They occupy space. They can be broken up into further bits and, and all of that. That's all what matter is. So physical reality or material reality, this is describing the fact that things are a certain way and the way things are is made of stuff that occupies space, that has weight and, and you know, all these other attributes and characteristics. So go ahead, Leroy. Well, the opposite would be some people think that we're just existing in the imagination of our mind, that we never really went to the moon. You know, they, they don't think anything is real, so they'd be the opposite of material or physical reality then. That's correct. Yeah. And so a realist who is a materialist would say that, yeah, there, there is a moon, and even if there were no humans on Earth, no beings, no life, let's say, the moon would still be there. It doesn't require our conception to make it be there. So that's an example of realism. And a materialist realist, someone who is actually saying, yes, the nature of this reality is physical, says that, that's what it is, and there's no other thing beyond that. There's no non-physical stuff. So material reality, and this is, again, what, what is truth. So this is what it's all about. Material reality is actually what it is. And to make a statement that matches physical reality, like if I say the moon exists, we would say that's a true statement. But what it means for that to be a true statement is that in physical reality, there is really a moon. If I say the moon does not exist, that's a false statement. It's a not true statement. And what that means to say that that statement is not true is to say that that statement does not match material reality. It doesn't match that. And so, same thing. What is true matches material reality. What is false does not match material reality. An action which goes against material reality is an action which is actually uh, immoral. We would say that it's based on falsehood because there's a conception that is against material reality, and an action is made based on that misconception, and thus it is immoral. So, to uh, get drunk, for instance, and then get in a car and drive 90 miles an hour and hit another vehicle, or hit a woman walking across the street or pushing a baby carriage or whatever is immoral because the person has a perception that's wrong, thus they're acting on falsehood, and that action that they do upon that falsehood is immoral because it's built upon falsehood. It, it's against reality. And then what do they do? They do something that is actually destroying a precious part of material reality. It's working against it. It's not creating uh, order and, and working in harmony with what is. It's destroying what is. And so that's really how morality is defined. 
and how we get that connection between truth and morality on one side and falsehood and immorality on the other side. And all of it is bound up with material reality or physical reality. And so, again, sexual immorality, understanding that and understanding morality, sexual immorality certainly is based upon the spirit of falsehood. It is a way of the spirit of falsehood. So anybody tries to tell you there's a place where nobody has any body or uh, no, they can walk through doors and walls. You know that's a lie because there isn't any such person or place. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Praise our Heavenly Family. Did I hear someone else, too, uh, wanting to make a comment? Perhaps not. Okay. Well, if there are no other questions or comments, I think it would be good to wrap up the call since we've been on for two hours now. Um, we may end up discussing this um, a bit more tomorrow night before moving on to the next thing. But, um, yeah, go ahead with your comment, Leroy. I was talking to a friend today, and he was talking about Ramadan and how the Muslims, their Ramadan is kind of like Lent of the Catholics. And but anyway, got to thinking afterwards that by the devil causing us all to have different beliefs, it makes everybody want to kill each other, you know, or get rid of anybody that doesn't, is not like them, you know. That's bad, you know. It's separating us instead of bringing us together in one. Yeah, this is what happens when people form beliefs not based on material reality as can be determined by evidence, but rather by having uh, an authoritarian system or whatever it may be. You know, there's, there's lots of ways that people can come up with belief systems not based on reality. But um, often it leads to those sorts of problems. So Heavenly Family, help us to change the world to uh, be to get over these these problems and help us ourselves to be sure that we live only according to the principles of truth. Amen. Amen. Not hate anybody just because they believe different than we do. Absolutely. Look down on them. So, um, would anyone like to thank our Heavenly Family and then we'll bring an end to this meeting? I will. Heavenly Family, we just thank you for the Sabbath and we thank you for the opportunity to investigate, to test things, to become better acquainted with reality and truth and uh, the stark contrast between truth and falsehood. Thank you for showing us that falsehood uh, there's nothing benign about it, that it truly does lead to death. Help us to let that settle in and to determine to put falsehood out of our lives and to help others do the same. We ask this for the sake of all humanity and for the sake of the universe most importantly, for your character's sake, for the, your reputation's sake. And we ask it in the name of Branch. Amen. 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 Guide us into all truth. Amen. True that. <laughs> all right. Well, love you all very much. Lila Tov. Shabbat Shalom.
Lila Tov. Lila Tov. Shalom.